I know you're not here for me. But I am very glad to actually see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are here, if I'm not mistaken, to listen to one of the great writers of our time, Hanya Yanagihara, correct? She's invited by Passaporta and hosted here tonight at Flaget by Flaget. My name is Annelies Beck. I'll be doing the conversation, the interview with her. And I'm sure you know all about her. She's um, the editor-in-chief of uh, Tea Style magazine of New York Times. She's also the daughter of a Hawaiian father, an oncologist, and a Korean mother. And there's some Japanese in the mix as well. And throughout her life as a young woman and child, a teenager, she traveled throughout the US, lived in various places in the wake of her father's career. She was born in LA and lives in New York at the moment. But most of all, of course, she's a novelist of three wonderful books, very different books. Her debut is called The People in the Trees. And she has this story, or she keeps saying that only 12 people in the world ever read it. I don't know, are there any people here who read her debut novel? Yes, okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I think easily 10, maybe 12, so she'll have to adapt her story and mention that at least 24 plus me is 25 people have actually read it. Great. Second, there was a little life. I can hear you. It was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, among others, and Women's Prize for Fiction sold millions. And now there is a new novel, To Paradise. According to some, it's three novels in one. It will be the focus of our conversation tonight, but of course we will be referring back and forth to her previous work. And now I have a confession to make. I'm a professional interviewer. That means that when I interview an author, I prepare by reading the novels, thinking about them, trying to figure out what the author was trying to achieve, looking at the way they use language to achieve their goals, but also trying to stay in touch with my first feeling about a book as a reader, like you are. And then to combine both heart and mind, feeling and thought in preparing questions based also on research about the author, about their body of work, and so on. In the hope that when we're on stage, I can make the author tell you all the things they want to share with you, the readers, the audience. Why is this a confession? Because I'm a bit nervous. Not because of Hania. She's brilliant. She's kind. I'm not worried about her. I'm worried about you. Because A Little Life, the book that sold millions of copies, was one of those books that became the book of the reader. It's always the case that when an author publishes a book, it's no longer his or her book, it's the reader's book. But some novels become the reader's book in a big way. It's a book that people lived in, that people loved, that they wept for and with. Readers befriended the characters for the rest of their lives. And I admit there are also people who hated it, who thought it was overwrought, who thought it was too melodramatic, who basically shied away, recoiled from the abyss and from the unspeakable things that the author dared speak about in this book. So anyway, whether you loved it or not, this is a book that stirred people up, that made a difference in many, many lives. 
So you can imagine that sitting here as a representative of you, the readers, that feels a bit daunting. Because I know it's a precious book. This is a precious author to many of you. Anyway, it's my job, so I'll be doing it. Don't worry. Two practicalities, and then it's time for our honored guest. Ms. Jana Gihara, Jana Gihara will be signing copies of your books. Afterwards, you'll be getting a post-it note so you can write down uh, the name you want the dedication to on it um, so we don't waste time spelling out all kinds of names. And also, um, we will make sure there's some time for some Q&A at the end of the evening. Enough of me now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Hanya Yanagihara. God, look at all these books. I have to say that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a big margin of error there walking down those steps. So I find this a real triumph that I didn't fall. And I'm so grateful to all of you for coming. It's very special for me to be back in Brussels after I think six years, maybe five. Uh, the last time I came, it was raining and cold. And I brought the sun with me from Paris, uh, but I'm, Thank I'm, you. So great. I'm so grateful to all of you for being here and for all of your support of, um, of, of my work. It means so much to me and to be able to be here without COVID restrictions in particular is really meaningful. So thank you. It goes without saying that we are very grateful that you're here because you're on a very busy tour to uh, make sure that to paradise mm. gets to the reader, to its paradise, I would almost say. Before we delve into the book and the novels, mm. there are um, three short questions I would like to uh, put to you. Okay. Um, bear with me, they're a bit uh, off track, let's okay. say. So you live in a smallish apartment yeah. full of beautiful things in New York. You work as an editor, as I said, for T, New York Times uh, style magazine. So two aspects of you. Where do world events like pandemics and wars fit in your life? Well, you know, on one hand, I mean, I, I should answer both as a citizen and as, as someone who works where I do, and, and as a novelist, and they're three separate answers, really. In particular, you know, and you experience these three things, and you know this because you're also a citizen, a journalist, and a novelist, and you manage to experience them simultaneously but differently. As a citizen, you, are, you feel the same confusion and outrage and fear that I think your fellow, um, you know, your fellow country people feel. As a journalist, and you know, although I don't cover hard news, I'm not a part of the national or international report at the New York Times, I am, I, I do have a great respect and I am versed in how journalism works, by which I mean, I know what it takes to make a, a, a news report happen. It's been many years since I've edited that kind of story, but I understand how it happens and it gives me a great deal of respect for the people um, who make that report, and they happen to be my, my peers and colleagues, if not my direct colleagues. And so when you watch an event like, like what's happening in the Ukraine, or you watch the pandemic, part of you just feels a great deal of professional awe at the fact that you know people who are working so hard and are often risking their lives uh, to, to, to bring the story to, to you and to all of your fellow readers. And so there's an element of awe. And the third element is as a novelist. I think that in a way I find what novelists, what I find as a novelist I respond to are not the big events. It's the details, it's the smaller events. It's the sort of, um, it's the things that, uh, that don't necessarily seem to seem catastrophic in and of themselves but seem to augur or to trigger a catastrophe. And you know, sometimes you need distance 
Um, and a lot of, I think, fiction comes out of having questions that you can't answer as, as a citizen or as an individual. And you think, well, maybe through the lens of creation, maybe through the lens of fiction, maybe through the lens of make-believe, I can try to answer something. I can try to articulate what it is I'm feeling. I can try to make myself feel less helpless. And so I, I, I think that you, that you experience them simultaneously and differently. That's a very interesting answer that we need to unpack throughout the evening. Second question, um, when you travel, whether it be for work or privately, um, do you feel at home easily? And what does it take for you to feel at home? Do you have little rituals or do you make sure you have a certain something with you to make a place yours? I mean, I think the whole point of travel is to feel like a foreigner or like a guest. And, um, you know, it's a real pity, and I always tell people who want to be writers that they should travel, especially Americans who, who don't travel outside of the country for various reasons, and it's not... It's a big enough country, though. Yes, and it's not just from lack of curiosity. I think, I think a lot of people say Americans don't travel because we're provincial or we're not interested in the rest of the world, and there is some of that. But it's also because of practicalities. We have very few vacation days. The average American family doesn't make that much money. And so if you're going to travel, you want to travel someplace that's guaranteed to be relaxing. The idea of traveling because it's hard or because it's foreign or uncomfortable is, is, is a privilege in a way. But I, you know, I find, you know, I, for many years I was a travel editor, I, I worked at a travel magazine, and so I got to see places I wouldn't normally have chosen myself. And the point of traveling, especially as an American, is to feel uncomfortable, I think. So the idea of looking for home, although we all fantasize about it, is less important to me than it is to feel sort of knocked off balance. And I, I really do think that is what travel is supposed to do for you. Looking for a certain challenge and how do you deal with it I in think a it's, way? it's looking for something to upset your equilibrium yeah. because it makes you see differently. Okay, last question. How would your body introduce itself to your head and vice versa? I think, I think my head would say to the body, get out of the way. And the body would say to the head, you don't, you're not the boss here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> um, we're going to talk, um, to start with, about To Paradise, mm. new novel, Chunky one, clunky one. Yeah. Um, the title is worth a whole two days discussion already. Mm. To paradise um, implies both a journey to paradise and um, a destination. Very simple question to begin with. What does it mean to you, paradise? Do you have a, an image <clears throat> or is it something else? Well, you know, I'll start with a fairly, I did not, I was not raised in a religious tradition that believed in paradise, in the concept of paradise. Um, my father was nominally Buddhist, but of a very ascetic strain. So it, it, he did not, he, there are certain, you know, strains of Buddhism or sects of Buddhism that believe in some kind of nirvana, but he was not of that, of that school. So the idea of um, there existing in some sort of figurative or literal form of heaven was not an idea that I was raised with, and it's not one that is particularly resonant to me, although I do love artwork from across cultures depicting the idea of heaven. As an American, though, <clears throat> traditionally the idea of paradise has meant the West. And if you look at how America expanded, it was they went West and West and West, and then they fell off the mainland and they came to Hawaii. So this idea, I think that Americans have two ideas of paradise. The first is that it is a physical elsewhere, and the second is that it is something achievable within you. And one of the big issues, I think, in America is this idea that happiness, with which I think Americans are particularly obsessed, is something that can be found, and if it can't be found, it means you either haven't worked hard enough or you haven't believed hard enough. So this idea that bliss, which is different than cont from contentment, is something, a, a paradisal state, is something that is within all of us to find and achieve, 
that finding happiness becomes another kind of achievement, much like money or much like titles or, or, or mm -hmm. whatever you want to say, or championship sports rings. And, and that concept, that it is a race to paradise, I think is a particularly American one too. It's an American idea, but it's not just about, in the book, I think about happiness, it's also about safety. It's mm. a place of safety, potentially of safety. Would you agree? It, yes, but it, and in the book it's also about feeling like uh, you somehow have fallen into step with society. I think all of the characters in the three sections of this book feel, uh, even if they're privileged, even if they do technically belong within the society, that they have been somehow shut out, that something is deficient within them, and if they could correct that something, they would finally feel that they are a part of, that they belonged in some way. And that idea of belonging is universal, but it is, it is also something that transcends you know, many cultures and, 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 and climates as well. In that respect, it's also very um, striking that um, most of the characters you might say in the book are, are stuck in one place or are a um, victim of the idea, like you already mentioned, of mm. this unattainable paradise yeah. or this paradise is just simply not for them. You're either in or out in a way. Yes, I think that they all feel that, that, that there is something deficient within them, that mm -hmm. somehow uh, something has eluded them about the, the society in which they live and that something is, is love and a sense of, of, of comfort. Mm -hmm. Love and comfort. Um, maybe we should say something about the structure of the book right mm -hmm. now uh, for everyone to, to uh, get on board. Um, the arch of, of the novel um, is three big parts, mm. some people say three books in one, mm. um, set in 1893, one in 1993, and one in 2093, um, in and around Washington Square, New York, mm. and in Hawaii, mm. correct? And throughout these three parts, um, characters appear with recurring names, like David, Nathaniel, Edward, Charles, uh, and last names like Bingham and, and Griffith. And these people may or may not be related um, to some degree, maybe echoes of one another. And I wondered about those names recurring. Um, does that say, did you use that or do that to say something about time and your mm. vision of history? Is mm. this about history repeating itself or not repeating itself? Or is it, mm -hmm. what is it? Well, First of all, who's read the book? Oh, a lot of people, wow. All right, but we'll still try not to spoil anything, I guess. It's, it's gonna be difficult, but yeah. Yeah, we'll do so it though. You, uh, you'll manage. You know, I always <laughs> say that, you know, time is an arrow, but history is a helix. And, and, and it, it loops back around itself again and again, which is why this idea of progress, um, or, or, you know, which is one of the, the promises of modernity is that things will keep getting better in all senses is not quite true. Progress, you know, sort of boomerangs back on itself and, and you suddenly find yourself in periods of regression and that's been true throughout history. Sometimes it's, it's looked for, like make America great again. Right, That's right. like before. Right, right, exactly, exactly, exactly. And I think many countries have turned to their past to try to sell a vision of the future. You know, so as Annalise said, there's, there's all of the names in the book repeat. The, f the four main protagonists are named David, Charles, Edward, and Nathaniel. And they, uh, they appear in different guises in each of the three sections. And I guess I had, was playing with the sense that we always think that we as individuals are responsible for shaping a society, but what if actually society were shaping us? What if, what if the people were the fixed point and the society was changing around them? And this idea that it, it decentered history from individuals and made it instead, it made history itself some sort of organic, living, breathing thing, and we sort of being ferried along in its wake. So our agency as human beings is very limited. Somewhat, but, but not entirely, because I think one of the, the things I hope the book argues is that no matter the society you live in, no matter how um, despotic your, your, your leader is, no matter how totalitarian the state is, that there are certain fundamental desires that cannot be stamped out from humanity and you know those are the desire to love the desire to be loved the desire to find affection the desire to find beauty and those are elemental to what humans are 
and they cannot be changed. And that too has been proven true in culture after culture and century after century. Okay, let's um, look at part one. Mm. Washington Square, 1893. Think of Edith Wharton mm. novels or Henry James. Mm. Um, what uh, started this particular part? Because if I'm not mistaken, this is what started the whole novel, what well, became To Paradise, I, correct? I, I, I conceived of the three parts simultaneously. I, this is another question to the audience. Who here has read Henry James? Oh, that's very interesting. You know, no one in the UK has read him. I mean, it's, and it sort of makes sense. They have their own people. They don't need to be reading Henry James. But I don't think, um, I don't think anyone in the States really reads James anymore. I mean, he was, they, they watch the movies maybe based on his work. Maybe, but I think, I think Americans gravitate towards his peer to Edith Wharton more. I mean, she's funnier, the books are frothier, they're more sort of, I mean, if Sex and the City were set in sort of 1880s, they would be, that would be Edith Wharton. Um, and, uh, and Henry James is, is, I think, is less read now than when I was growing up, when you, when you sort of had to read him. So Washington Square, um, which you have here, was mm -hmm. his, it's his most accessible book. It's from 1880. He later disowned it, he, he, it, it wasn't his favorite. And it's a very simple story. It's about um, a, a young woman, an heiress, named Catherine Sloper and her father, Dr. Sloper. And she is, she's a plain young woman and she falls in love with this handsome you know, man who her, her father and uncle are convinced is a swindler. And the, her father says, if you run off with this man, you're disinherited. It's, a, it's kind of a tale as old as time. And one of the things I found most interesting about this book when I first encountered it was that it has, Dr. Sloper is a very cruel father. He's, he, he's almost a little too, too villain-like, I think. He's very unloving. And James was writing this in a period of great sentimental fiction, in which fathers were loving, not always, but when they were, they really were, and children were loving, and, and this idea, this, this hangover of a Victorian sense of family was, um, was, was at its peak. And what James suggests in this book is that a parent's love for his child is not inviolable, that a parent can actually not love their child and not want the best for them. And I found that a really gripping modern concept when I first read it. And as I was rereading it a few years ago, I thought, you know, I'd always wondered what would this book be if, if you know, I love marriage stories, I should say, and they're a staple of many literary traditions. Mm -hmm. But of course, marriage stories are also money stories. All novels are about money, really. I mean- All novels? Yes, it's only in the postmodern age that we've been able to pretend they're not. But if you look at Tolstoy, that was about money. Dickens is about money. Austin is about money. And I'm, I'm naming, you know, Western novels, but that's, it's, you know, Tanizaki's books are about money. They were all about money. And, and the character, particularly female characters' choices, were determined by how much money she had or how much money she could marry into. And Austin, marriage was a financial transaction. Yes, yes, it wasn't a love story, and Austin knew that very well, for example, the most famous marriage story writer of our, of our time, of her time. And so I thought, well, what if I could write a marriage novel that was not about, about um, sort of a, a gendered association with money? What would that story be? And at the same time, I was thinking, what if America was not founded on Puritanism? what would immediately change? Our ideas about love would change, our ideas about gender would change, our ideas about race would not change as they do not change within the first section of this book. Maybe for, for, for a European audience, oh, yes. what, what, what is the uh, essence of, of American Puritanism? What does it convey to you well, when you quite, say that? I mean, it's quite Calvinist, really, you know, and it, it, was, it was founded on a, a rigid and, and, and also kind of ascetic idea about duty and industry um, and it, it was joyless, uh, and that is, you know, how America was founded, and although America's a secular country, you see echoes of that sort of moral righteousness yeah. all the time in our politics today. So you thought, I'm going to rewrite history and I inject thought, I'm some to, joy. I'm going to, not necessarily, <laughs> I thought I'm going, to re, I'm going to lift this part of this religious uh, spine of, of, of our, our country out of it and see what happens. And that's a great joy to get to do as a novelist. You know, one of the books that I think To Paradise 
is in conversation with is Michael Cunningham's Specimen Days, which was his book after the hours. And when I sent him to Paradise to read, he said something that I thought was very interesting. He said, I don't know why novelists are so faithful to history. And what he meant was, and this is very true, I think, why do literary writers feel that they have to obey history as it's been written and recorded? Fantasy writers don't think that way. Science fiction writers don't think that way. Playwrights tend not to think that way, but novelists do. And it was, it was, um, it, it, was, there was, it was a great, it was a very joyful exercise picking and choosing what I wanted from American history, discarding what I didn't, what didn't suit me and adding what I wanted to. Yeah. Liberating, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and in this um, first um, part of the, of the book, it's still a story about marriage yes. in a way. Um, Same-sex marriages are legal in 1893 in your right. uh, US. Um, but still need to be arranged, need to be a bit um, organized. Um, it's a grandfather taking care of his uh, youngest um, grandchild and hoping to organize a happy marriage for right. him. Um, some of the readers will say, ah, again, same sex relationships and partnering. Is it one of your unending sources of inspiration or where does that come from? No, I mean, it's, uh, well, first of all, I mean, obviously there have always been, you know, gay people throughout history. What's, when uh, at T I edited this really great story by the Times' theater critic, Jesse Green, about how many artists are writing gay pasts into history that didn't exist. I mean, the novelist Sarah Waters, if any of you know her work. Fingersmith. Is, Fingersmith yeah. and Tipping the Velvet um, is someone who, who does that. Uh, the American playwright George C. Wolfe does that. I mean, there's, there's many people who, who, um, who are engaged actively in, in, re, uh, in not just making gayness coded in, in stories, but making it forthright. Um, and, you know, it was, um, it, it was less specifically about writing gay characters than it was about writing a different version of of what um, of American generosity. And there have been many, many times when America has not been very generous to many groups of people, and one of those groups of people has been has been gay people. But really, the books, the three sections of the book, are about nation building. I think, and in each section, there is someone or a group of individuals who are concerned with trying to build the idea of a nation and trying to make it last. Mm -hmm. and, and that is obviously the ongoing um, struggle of, of what America is. It's a young country that is by the day trying to define itself. You said uh, America is in its adolescence. Mm. Is that where you still feel it's at? Oh yes, I mean, I think that America as a country, and I say this as someone who considers herself profoundly American, uh, but America as a country resembles a precocious child, like in a precocious 10-year-old. I mean, all of the great qualities and all of the bad qualities, you know, it's, it's in, you know, our enthusiasm, our forthrightness, our boldness, our curiosity, and also we're spoiled, we're also incurious, we, you know, we throw temper tantrums, we want things immediately, the sense of instant gratification. All of those are qualities you associate with a prepubescent child. And as a nation, that is also how we behave too, I think. Interesting, how would you, where, what age do you think Europe is? Do you have any idea? You've traveled extensively. How old are we? Middle-aged. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but isn't 60 I, the new something? <laughs> I think Europe is, I think Western Europe is sort of a very tired and world weary 49 year old. <laughs> and then Asia is, you know, you know, like a 67 year old who does aerobics. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's something to aspire to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it gets better as you keep, as you keep living. <laughs> okay. Back to the nation building. Um, is it fair to say you look at it through the uh, prism of a family and the experiment of a family, as Charles in the third um, mm -hmm. part uh, calls it, and 
what shape or form family can actually take, who takes care of whom, who belongs to the unit uh, yeah. or not. I, I think that's part of it. You know, the triangle between the Charleses, the Davids, and the Edwards that repeats in each section of the book is ultimately that there is someone who needs care, there's someone who provides care, and there's someone who to some extent disrupts that relationship. Uh, you know, I think of a little life was in a way about trying to remap or redefine what a friendship could be. I hope that one of the things this book does is redefine or remap what parenting can be. And, and one of the things I hope it suggests is that parenting is sometimes an older person taking care of a younger person. And a, that's grandfather it. a grandfather often A grandfather, sometimes here. an older lover or friend. Yeah. It, it, it can be, it is the act of caring for someone who is, is younger and has had simply fewer years under their belt. But it's interesting because you you go even further and um, one of the characters, one of the Edens, because there are some women in the story obviously as well, um, and a recurrent one is Eden. She says of herself, um, I don't think I have it in me to be a mother. It, it seemed as if, um, apart from uh, Miss Holson, for example, that mothers and fathers are sort of moved out of the picture. Mm. Is that a conscious choice or did it just work out that way? Well, you know, I, I've, I've said this before to US audience, but um, once you've written your third book and you're writing your third book, certain things become clear to start revealing themselves to you. Certain themes, certain motifs, you don't know how they got there or what they mean. And, um, you know, I, I don't know why there are no mothers in any of my three books. I don't know why um, there's always a struggle about a name, about uh, the, the significance of a name. I don't know why there are grandparents in this book. I was not close to my own and never, and never hoped to have a close relationship. Uh, you just don't really know. And um, it, it's, it's one of the mysteries of, of, of writing a book and then getting to talk about it that you start in, in talking about the book and in, in hearing how readers have experienced it. You see things in it that you did not intend to do, you had no idea you were doing, and you're, you're you know, and you're kind of, you're, you're left to try to figure it out on your own. You're taught about your own work in a way. Yes, you are, you are completely taught about your own work, which yeah. is, you know, why I always say, and I, I, I especially felt this for a little life, that once you publish the book, the book is not yours anymore. And mm. I think actually Roland Barthes said this, you know, that it, it is not yours anymore, it's the reader's. And your job as the author and the creator of the work is to stand out of the way and to not disrupt the reader's relationship with that book and, um, and, and to not dispel their ideas that they have about it, in a sense. You know, it's a very intimate relationship that a reader has with a book. It's different than a viewer has with a film, for example. You're watching it. Um, it, it, there's just something tactile, even if you're reading it in, in an e-book or you're listening to it in your, in your AirPods. There, it, is, it is a completely one-on-one -on -one experience in the way that few other kinds of art are. You know, often you're in an audience or you're, you know, you're in a museum or what have you. And so I think it makes sense that, that readers have these, can, can develop these very intense relationships with the characters in a book, say, with, with the arc of a book itself, with the world of the book. And it, it, there is really, it's a miraculous thing to see happen as, as the writer. Um, but in a way, um, it, it, the, the book becomes less and less knowable to you. And I've certainly felt that with, with A Little Life, for example. With A Little Life, so you feel more detached from the book. Is that not the detached right? from not it. detached. No, okay. I, I just find it more and more mysterious. You know, I, it, it is, um, you know, when I think about that book, I, what I remember most vividly, I mean, I, I can reread passages of it and not understand how I got there, how, how, what I was thinking. I can remember where I was when I wrote it and the emotions I was feeling at the time. But I often think, and you know, could I rewrite this book now? And the answer is probably no. Okay, but you, you're still happy with it? Yes, I mean, I, 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 I sort of look at it as something that's grown up and left me. You know, it's it's not, it's it's um it it, you know it it was um it's a golem in no sense. You know, it it someone breathed life into it, a reader did, and and now it's yeah, and now it's tottered off on its own. Okay, um, I mean this is a very cliched image, so forgive me, but I mean you you don't have children, 
um, would you consider your books? I mean, you use the, the, the kind of um, um, language for it as this is what I pass on to the world. Um, no, and I think that, I, I don't think of them that way. And you know, there actually is a long passage in, in To Paradise about uh, this conversation about legacy and can a person be somebody else's legacy? It's incontrollable, yes. a person. And yes, that's... and I think the answer is no. But I suppose it is like a child in the sense that you don't know um, it, how it is received how it finds its way in the world is beyond your control. So yeah. yes, in that sense, yes. Okay, and uh, as with a child, you cannot protect the child from the right. outer world and right. how it's right. um, but you also don't. But you also welcomed. don't. You also don't feel you need to in the same way. You know, it's it's not a person. It's not something that um, uh, whose whose safety you fear mm -hmm. for. About the parenting um, throughout the book. Um, people reflect on what it is to take care of another person, a younger person, like you mentioned. Um, and in the third section, which is set in 2093, but also has passages set uh, decades earlier in um, letters written at the time, um, there's a scientist, Charles, um, specialized in pandemics, virology, rings a bell, um, who is thinking about parenting because he takes care of his granddaughter, Charlie. Uh, and at, at one point, he confesses to his friend, he thought, I, I wasn't convinced that life is actually definitely worth um, achieving or safeguarding. Mm -hmm. um, so why would you put a child in this world? I think that's something that many people, readers, mm -hmm. can relate to, that, that not necessarily to the conclusion or the, the idea, but the worry about that. Um, but first, tell us that you started writing this pandemic section, section before the actual pandemic, right? Yes, yeah, so I started um, researching the pandemic part of the book in 2017, and I went to Rockefeller University, which is a biological sciences postgraduate university in, Man in Manhattan that many Manhattanites don't know exist, actually. And um, I interviewed this terrifying French virologist, and he said, um, who seemed a little excited because he said there's another one coming. And, uh, and his, one of the problems he said is that America had not invested enough money into virology because they spent too much money researching cancer, which is another conversation. But his, his point was that, you know, that, that microbes had become so numerous and we had taken too many antibiotics and they become too strong and also there was too much travel and it just so, you know, a, a great disease was forthcoming and inevitable. At the same time, I also talked to a scientist at a group called Eco Health Alliance in New York that specializes in zoonoses. And his argument was that another one would soon be coming because, and these are both people who had studied Ebola and, and, the, and variations of the flu and so on and so forth. And his argument was that another one would soon be coming because we had eaten up so much, you know, wild land that we had wild creatures in proximity with livestock. And so an increased threat of zoonoses was, was guaranteed. And um, so we're still talking 2017. Of course, we all know this now, yes, but that we all know was it then now. new. Yeah. yeah. And so when it actually, you know, we were sent home from the office on March 13th of 2020, and I was probably about halfway through the pandemic section of the book. Nothing changed. And it, it felt like two separate, and this goes back to what I was saying at the top of the conversation about how does one react to a, an event as a journalist, a fiction writer, and as a citizen. As a citizen, of course, I was very worried and I was scared and I was confused and, and, and I, I was, um, uh, you know, I was, I was anxious. As a writer, though, it was my world. I knew what I was doing within it. I was the god and I had ultimate control. And I think in retrospect, it probably gave me a great sense of comfort to have that sense that there was a world I could, and also the diseases in this world, in this book are much worse than the one we are living through. And there through. have been several yes, uh, pandemics a, already. Right, it's yeah. an age of serial pandemics. Uh, and so, it, but, but very little changed. I don't remember ever thinking that it was eerie or that it, it, or that it was a strange coincidence. It, it just, for some reason, it never, it never occurred to me. 
But the thing that really did make me feel better in a way during this period, the period of the lockdown in New York, is the person who introduced me to these scientists was a family friend who works for Anthony Fauci at the National Institutes of Health. And he sent me um, a chart listing all of the major pandemics in known and hu recorded human history over the past few thousand years. And you looked at things like the Justinian plague or the Black Death, which killed, I think, you know, um, a quarter of Europe's population and then a half of Europe's population at the time. And you realize that through all of that, you know, people kept having babies and art kept being made and trade continued and the cities kept being built, that, that the stuff of life kept happening. Mm -hmm. One of, I think, and even in this book, which is the, in which the diseases are very severe and they also have the added, I think, um, burden of intense climate change, disaster, I should say, climate disaster. Even in this book, the things that make us human do continue. They do, um, but also people change. Um, I want to get into emotions um, and how people act and feel. Charlie in the third section, the young woman who tells part of the story, um, was at some point, I don't think this is too much of a spoiler, affected by uh, the pandemic. And in the eyes of her grandfather has become effectless. She has to be taught to act like a human being again, um, copying how people behave, learning what is expected in a conversation, how to react, how to keep a conversation going, start a conversation. She really has to learn this. But her grandfather, interestingly, thinks, although he, he feels very sorry for her and he misses the bright, sprightly young woman she was, a child, he thinks maybe she's better equipped to live in this world the way she's now, um, because incrementally throughout all these pandemics, society has changed a lot, has become much more authoritarian. And he himself as a scientist has played a certain role in that. Um, but back to the emotions, is, is that something you see happening, for example, in the US that emotions, uh, that change or how people deal with emotions and feeling. There's a whole section in the book where Charlie wonders about feelings. She asks herself, what is it I'm feeling? Are there words to put to these things that are going on inside me? How do no, you feel I, about I that? I don't think that's changed in the United States. I think what has changed, or maybe this hasn't changed at all, maybe it's just been revealed again. I think that one of the I think depressing things for people at various points across the political spectrum in, in, in over the past couple of years was that the appeal to um, citizens to act for the society to, you know, for example, you must wear masks or you must get vaccinated because of your neighbors didn't the resonate. The collective. Yes, yeah. didn't resonate. This idea that that part of being a member of society means that sometimes you do things to protect the other members of society did not land the way I think I, that way I expected have. it to, for example, yeah. you know. Um, and, and that was, um, I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised, but it was sobering. But where does the idea of losing your capacity to communicate and, and feeling obvious things come from? Well, in Charlie's case, it certainly wasn't meant to make some sort of grander statement about a loss of compassion or humanity among, among young people. But, you know, in Charlie's case, she is affected by one of the drugs that she has to take. And it it's an was, interesting side effect to have thought up. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, but, but I think there are many, many difficult when you're treating, you know, my father's an oncologist. And when you're treating children with severe illnesses, the drugs often take something from them. Um, and, you know, one of the things I, come, I came to admire about Charles, the scientist, her grandfather, in this section, is how he learns to readjust his idea of what a successful child is, you know, and, and, and when that he, 
the expectations that he has for her um, begin to change and to morph based upon who she is and not the ghost of what she was. Mm -hmm. It's, he, he learns how to become really an, a stimulating and accepting father right. or father figure, parent figure. Um, but tied to these emotions um, is also the element of imagination. Um, throughout the book, there, there's a suggestion um, in the three sections that to imagine too much, to aspire too much, can backfire, can be dangerous. Yes, that that's maybe true. it's better not to dream yes, too much. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, so, but 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 you're or the characters are ambivalent. Some some go for it. Like for example, one of the David said um, is dreaming up his life with with his love interest Edward, and he's talking about the bravery of love and. Picturing well, the I, life. I think in both this book and in A Little Life, there is an argument, a, a bit of a sub rosa argument, that hopefulness can be tyrannical. That, it, that this idea that we have that if we hope hard enough, that things will, again, that self-improvement, that salvation is within, is a very punishing message to tell some people. Because it means that if you don't achieve that, if you can't find that, you failed. And that, that argument, I think, runs through this book as well. Through both books, but also you need imagination to be able to picture an alternative life, maybe a better life, and to right. act upon it if you are so inclined or not. Well, I don't know. You know, I mean, this idea of what kind of how should we be raising children for the world to come is, I think, a very interesting one. I mean, I have a friend who is German-American, and she moved with her family back to Germany some years ago. And she said something I thought was very interesting. Her children were very young at the time. Uh, she said, "She said I feel that Germany will better prepare them for the, for the world that's to come. And what she meant by that was that she wanted to take them out of a culture that was so competitive. She wanted to give them access to more languages. She wanted to give, bring them to a more international city, Berlin in this case. She wanted to... Um, to, to take them to a place in which money was not um, paramount in everybody's lives, in which they could understand that there are other routes to happiness, um, in which they could have countryside nearby. I thought that was a very um, yeah. interesting way of putting it. So do things come to mind? Pro progression is overrated on the one hand, together with happiness. And second, um, again, one of the characters uh, deals with a with, uh, uh, pandemic in the middle section. Um, it's not called AIDS, but the suggestion is there. The um, elements remind you of that uh, episode or that time. Um, and, and he relates how he's asked, how could you function at a time when people were dying around you, your friends, you were constantly going to funerals. And uh, one of the lines is, uh, by not allowing fantasies to extend beyond the year, a number of the characters are self-protective, or so it seems to me, in that they, they make their world smaller. Also, Charlie in the third section says, well, it's better to just not look beyond and go through the motions of the daily grind, I would almost say, but it's almost I, I, but too I negative. Think, I, I think that a lot of us are thinking about how to conceive of not only our futures, but our children's futures in, in this period. I mean, you know, is it, um, what, are, what are useful things for them to learn? What are, how, are, how should we encourage, the, how hopeful should we encourage them to be? Um, you know, but what maybe they think we are, we, the middle-aged ones, are uh, too complacent and, and, I mean, look at the climate. Uh, oh, yes. I mean, if youngsters. I were a child now, I would be furious. You know, I may think young people are furious and for good reason. They have been failed by every system around them. And not only by the systems around them, but the individuals within that system. I understand why they're so angry. And so for people who are very young children, I think the, the calculus becomes even harder. How are they going to raise these children? What kind of future should they hope for? Will they recognize the, the future for which they're preparing their children? And are those preparations really going to be for naught? Mm -hmm. I want to jump to the middle section now. Uh, you use it to uh, address another theme. You've already mentioned nation building. Mm. Um, 
the larger part of this section is uh, set in Hawaii, um, where, again, we meet a David and an Edward, among others. And there's this dream of recreating the kingdom of Hawaii. Yes. Um, maybe you should tell us a little bit about your connection to Hawaii and also uh, the reality of that history and what you added mm -hmm. to it as a novelist or just subtracted. So one of the things I wanted to do in this book is to present a very autobiographical understanding of America, by which I mean that depending on the kind of America you grew up in, or if you didn't grow up in America at all, you will see or miss certain things. The book begins in 1893. That was the year that the last queen, the last monarch of Hawaii, was overthrown. Uh, this, the country was annexed five years later and was became a state, um, a United part of the United States in 1959. So again, if you grew up on the West Coast, if you grew up in Hawaii, you will understand that um, that the that the book is to some extent about America's imperialist experiment in the Pacific. If you didn't grow up, uh, if it's not that, uh, and it's not taught as much on the East Coast, so maybe you wouldn't understand that. You know, in the third part of the book, there are these relocation centers where they send the sick, and those relocation centers are named after um, the, the internment centers that Japanese Americans were sent during World War II. And at various points in the recent past, the government has discussed reactivating those camps. You know, I, I, you know, in, in if any of you have read David Francis' How to Survive a Plague, he discusses, which was about the AIDS, sort of the peak of the AIDS epidemic in, in America, he discusses how there was discussion that, um, that all gay men should be rounded up and sent to camps, for example. During the, the Muslim ban, there was more discussion about how you know, you know, Muslim Americans should be rounded up and sent to camps. So these, this, 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 this theme is not, is, is, is not a one-off in, in, in modern American history. But Hawaii was, was a kingdom, and um, it was, as I said, um, annexed in 1898. And if you grew up there as an Asian American, as I did, you know, most Asians came because their, our ancestors came to work the fields. You, they worked in, pi they picked pineapples and they picked cane, sugar cane. And so when you're growing up there, you are very much aware that, um, you know, you were not part of the ruling class there and yet you were also living on somebody else's land um, and you were living within um, what was once a kingdom. And where Asians are predominant, the, the predominant and the majority um, uh, ethnic group in, in, in the islands, but you were very aware, or at least I was always aware because my parents were sympathetic to the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, um, which made a resurgence in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you know, was inspired by black power. And they did really believe that the kingdom should in some sense be restored. But the larger theme, and that is not a fringe position in Hawaii, I think. You know, my parents are fairly, um, uh, you know, moderate liberal baby boomers. And, and I think many people would agree that, that, that there needs to be some sort of restitution. Um, uh, but, you know, the other thing is that, um, I'm always interested in this idea that many Americans have of the lost homeland. You know, in this part of the book, um, they try to create a prelapsarian Hawaii, a pre-contact, a pre-Captain Cook Hawaii. But many of us in the United States, those of us whose ancestors chose to come to the United States, have this idea of a home we left and we romanticize it heavily. And so the country is in some sense made up of many people who have an idea of Germany from, you know, of, of Prussia from, you know, the 19th century or of Japan from the 19th century or from Ireland from the 19th century. It, it is, it, and, and these fantasies of, of countries and cultures that no longer exist, I think fuel a lot of Americans' ideas about what America should be and what, and what they left and some of them hold on to it through um, artifacts, cherishing yes. them, um, trying to, to um, contextualize them also. And, and, um, but then there's the whole discussion about who gets to look at it and put it on a pedestal, and right. the whole appropriation discussion is also in the, in the book. Well, this, this, I think, is a question every museum in every country is, is asking itself 
and has been asking itself since since the Second War, World War. You know, can it be resolved? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, and and of course, the counter argument is that um, is that cultures blend and shift and 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 reform and 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 all the time, and every culture is a palimpsest, and many countries have been colonized. The, the, the idea that colonization is, is something that can be eradicated or, or turned back is, is not a possibility, and yet some of the injustices and the, um, the, the unfairnesses born from colonization might be able to. Yeah, so it's again time looping right. back on itself. Right. Um, right. But it also begs the question of um, whether you consider yourself as an author God, you actually already, slip of the tongue or not, uh, said as much, um, because there's not only the appropriation discussion, but also who gets to write in what voice. Mm -hmm. And there was some discussion, apparently, on social media about whether a woman can write um, about gay men having relationships, sexual relationships as, um, as well. Yes, I mean, I think an Does artist... Does it concern you? No. I think an artist can and should write about anything. You know, we had... Um, I think for two reasons. You know, we ran a very interesting profile with the American playwright Tony Kushner in December, and he was talking about... Uh, he, was, he wrote the screenplay for West Side Story, and he said, uh, you know, something like, I refuse to think that I'm causing harm or doing violence by writing about Puerto Rican teenagers, or writing the voice of Puerto Rican teenagers. Because he said, one of the great things that art can do in this moment is offer empathic flights into somebody else's experience. And I do strongly believe that. The other thing is that if you are an American, many other places as well, you are going to be writing about other, other types of people because you are going to encounter those other, America is fundamentally others people who don't look like you, people who, you know, even if you live in a very, you know, homosocial or, or homoracial environment, you know someone of a different gender, you know someone in a different body, you know someone of different abilities. You, it is impossible if you're an American novelist not to populate your, your books with others because America's all others. Mm -hmm. There's so much insight in so many different um, fields there's the Hawaiian art, there's the virology, there's you name it, there's the, the landscape, um, the houses, the way they are um, furnished and so on. Are you a uh, obsessive researcher or how do you get all this information together and strewn throughout the book? I'm not that much of a researcher. I, I love talking to people about their jobs. And if any of you are writers, I think one of, you know, although not a lot of people read, everyone will talk to you if you say, I'm writing a book and I want to know what you do. And they'll typically be very generous with their time and articulate. I wonder if you found the same thing. So you pick everybody's brain. Yeah, and but people are very good at talking about what they do. And for example, when I was talk, talking to scientists beyond the terrifying French guy for the third part of the book, what you actually are discussing with them is their work. You know, it's what do you actually do all day? What would this person do? What do you gossip about? Who's in the office? What are the politics like? That, those sorts of details, more than anything, are what inform the novels that I write because they are very much, all of my novels are very much about work. Yeah, about work and, and also about how the lives of these characters are in the minutiae of what they feel what they see, the smells, mm -hmm. the things they remember are the small things, smoking a cigarette together on a rooftop uh, in the middle of a, a pandemic, for example. But that's where the life resides. But those are, that's also how we explain other people to, you know, if, if I were, you know, if you were introducing me to someone or telling someone about me, you might pick up on the details of me. And, and that really is how we digest people and how we, how we file them away to ourselves, I think, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. um, you use letters in your novels. What is it you like about letters as a form? Well, I think it's a very old-fashioned form. I think it's a very satisfying novelistic form. It's, you know, it's sort of tried and true. But also, a letter is very intimate. You know, uh, I mean, I, 
you know, I write a very, I'm of an age, I'm 47, and so when I was in college, email was just becoming widespread. And back in those days, if you called someone cross country, you paid a long distance fee. So it was a much cheaper way to communicate. And you would write in back in those days very long emails um, to, your, to your friends at other universities or colleges. Uh, and then they would, they would write back and, and it would be really satisfying and it would be much, much cheaper. But with my best friend, we've continued that habit. So I write him a very long email every night and he writes me back the next day. And there is something a little performative about writing letters, obviously. You're aware that you're writing them for posterity to some degree. And yet they're also, they're very intimate. You're saying things that are sometimes hard to say in person. You are also trying to make something entertaining. You are, um, you're trying to, it's a little journalistic. You're trying to make it a document of your day. Um, and, and, it's, and, and a letter very satisfyingly um, provides a lot of narrative about a person's life. I mean, I go back to, to emails I've written all the time to see what I was doing on that particular day, how I felt about a particular subject. They're very, um, there's, it's a, there's a reason that the form is endured. Mm -hmm. And you take it into the future, uh, which is uh, very nice to see. Before um, we go uh, over to the audience and have um, some of you ask uh, questions, I just wanted to um, quote something to you. You've, you've been asked before when Little Li A Little Life came out whether you ever wept or had a hard time writing certain scenes and you said, no, not at all. It was work I was doing. This book is heart-wrenching in a different way, in a more brainy way, I would say. Um, but was it always easy to write it? On an emotional level? Uh, I mean, I really felt for Charlie. I felt for all of them. I felt for David in the first part. Yes, you, I mean, you have to feel for these characters. You're, again, you're living with them for a very long time, and they have to feel that real to you. And so it, it, it should hurt somewhat. If it doesn't hurt, y then you haven't been invested enough in them. Yeah. Those of you who read it, did it hurt? Lift your hand. Yeah, okay. The others, we leave you to experience yeah. it for yourself. You guys um, have been such a good audience. You're so quiet. <laughs> it's really, it's really lovely. Thank you. I mean, not that you have to be quiet, but we were talking about German audiences before. How quiet they are. I mean, are they quieter than this audience? Much quieter. Even and they sit like this, completely upright. Let's see how quiet you are <laughs> if I throw the mic to you. Um, is there anyone out there who has a question? for Hanya. I see there's hands here there. and there, and there's a microphone going around. Is there an actual microphone? Yes, and coming this way to the front. Oh God, I can't see hello, anything. Hello, hello. Wave, wave, wave if you want to ask your question, because it's a bit dark here okay, in the front row. There's a green jacket, row. and I can't see beyond the green jacket. OK, nice there you try. go. Hi. Please state your Hi. name and... Hi, I am Astrid. Uh, Astrid. This might be a very stupid question, but I was just wondering that when you write, what do you prefer? Do you write by hand? Do you use a computer? Do you use a typewriter? And does it actually influence the way that you write for like a specific emotion? That's interesting. Are you a writer yourself? Well, I want to be. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'll say two things. I mean, there is no right answer, and I think, I think with with writers, it's, I think a lot of writing is unlearning the things you've been taught about writing. So I'll just say that. I, I write only on the computer, only on Microsoft Word. And, but I think most of the writing gets done before the physical act of writing begins. And I most, wrote most of A Little Life on the bus. You know, I used to take the bus up to my job and then I rode the bus back. And just something where you're mo in movement or swimming I find is very helpful and you're really, really wandering. And when you know that you've assembled the pieces in your head, then you begin to type, I think. Um, but, but for me, I've only ever written on the computer, but that is not, I, I, I think it's part of it is just experimenting and seeing what feels right for you. Thank you. Thank you. There's someone behind you. Yeah. 
Hi, thank you very much. Hi. Um, it's a bit of a general question, maybe, for aspiring young writers as well. Um, if you could go back in time to the moment when you started off writing, you were, you know, I don't know when you started, in your 20s or 30s, mm. um, and you could give yourself one piece of advice or one thing you did that you regret now, and you could just go back and slap yourself in the face and say, do this differently, what would yeah. it be? That's a good question. So my first book I wrote for 18 years, Actually, I wrote it for 16, I realized, but it was, but then it took another two years to get published. And I think my key mistake was, I was so horrified of being one of those people in my office, I was working at a magazine back then as well, who was always printing out his manuscript on the, on the, on the office printer <laughs> and talking about it and trying to get people to read it. And I so did not want to be that person that I kept it very quiet. And what I should have done all along is made myself accountable to a reader. And a good reader is not necessarily your friend or your peer who's the best writer. A good reader is this person who you feel can, can understand text the best, and it's a different skill. Um, you know, I'm very lucky to have in my best friend a great reader, the best editor I know. But once I became accountable to him, once I knew he was waiting for pages on the other end, which I, once I knew that he was engaging with and reacting to the text in some way, then the writing came very fast. That's what I should have done earlier. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, good, good luck with everything, too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. My name is Ilham. Um, my question is, what's your relationship with um, reviews of your book? Do you read them? Do you try to avoid them? Do you ever... Do you get annoyed by them? What's, how do you feel about them? I've never read anything. I've never read a review. I've never read anything on Amazon. I've never read an article. I've never read anything. And when I was publishing my first book, an older, wiser writer told me, the good reviews are never good enough, and the bad ones stay with you forever. And I don't understand why people read reviews, because you can't change it at that point. It's published. And it just feels, and it, there's two groups of people I really can't stand. The first are people who quote from the reviews, their good reviews, and are always telling you about them. And the second are the people who are always talking to you about their bad reviews. But at the end of it, and they're both insufferable groups of people to be around, you know, like you don't want to be around that. And writers are very self-absorbed. I don't know if you're a writer yourself. You can't become more self-absorbed. And so the only, and, and, but also, no one's opinion should count more to you than your own. So if you're getting a sense of validation from the good reviews, that's not a way to live. And if it's destroying you because the reviews are bad, that's also not a way to live. So it's better just to not engage. And I feel that I am, you know, and you just have to sort of hang on to your sense of perspective and sanity. And um, I really think I've done it by disengaging. You don't want to be understood or... or uh, well, what feel you, that you're understood? Well, what can you do? I mean, you can't, it's, it's, it just should not be, it should not be how you gauge your self-worth. It should not be how you see the work. It should not change your satisfaction or unhappiness with the work by, by, by what someone says. It, it just, it can't. It, it's a very slippery slope to go down. You know, I have a friend, I have friends who, have, who are artists in different genres. I never understand why they read reviews either. But I have one friend in particular, I have a very close friend who's a fashion designer, and he reads everything. No one in the history of, 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 of the world has ever said, you know, I was gonna buy that dress, but you know, now that I've read you know, so-and-so's review, I'm not gonna buy it anymore. I, I just think, he, and he, meanwhile, he has people who wear his work and love his work, and, and those are the people that you want to talk to, the people who your work have already um, spoken to in some way, and they're the people who deserve your conversation. Thank you. We have time for more. Yep, microphone moved a seat. Try again. Hello, hello. Uh-oh. Hello. Oh, oh, yes, there okay. you are. Hello, my name is Sakina. Hi. Um, I have a thematical question. Um, I feel like something that's so significant in your work is uh, your portrayal of pain and, and um, sometimes violence. 
Uh, do you think that we're at m the most intimate when we share our pain? Because I feel like novelists often write about the things that uh, are most intimate to them. That's a very interesting question. Do I feel that we're at our most intimate when we share our pain? I think, it's, I think sharing pain is a form of intimacy. But I don't think that sharing pain equates intimacy. I, there's a book by, that I always think about by, uh, by an, this Amer an American critic named Vivian Gornick, and it's called The Odd Woman in the City. And it's about her friendship, her long-term friendship with her friend Leonard. And in it, she makes an interesting observation that, that I've discussed many times with my best friend about how up until fairly recently, you know, in, into the modern age, a friend was not someone to whom you related the worst, you, you, that you, to whom you showed the worst parts of yourself. It was the person to whom you tried to show the best parts of yourself. And she uses as an example Wordsworth and his friend who I can't remember who the friend was. Um, but but, but the point was that Wordsworth tried to be for his friend the best he could be, not the worst he could be. So her point was the divulging of intimacies between friends, and I suppose one could also say this in, in art as well, um, is a modern invention. And, and is it perhaps something that we should reconsider? I, you know, I don't consider myself someone particularly wise about pain. Um, I, I, I do consider myself someone who, has, who is lucky enough to, to, to have in my life people who are wise about pain. And I think that a lot of what I do as a writer is to try to understand their intrinsic wisdom about suffering in a way that I can't quite. They know something that I don't these friends of mine. And one of the things I think I try to do in writing is, is, is touch what they understand. Interesting question. One more here. Oh. Where's the microphone? Over there. God, I can't see anything. I'm here, oh. over here. Over there, Hi. in the oh, back. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so in reading To Paradise, what struck me was how it ended in comparison to your first two books, which ended definitively, potentially open to interpretation from time to time. But we did know how they ended. And I don't know if this is something that I can even ask, because you're going to transpose some of your own understanding and experience onto the book. But what struck me with To, Par to Paradise was these three stories ended kind of open. We don't actually know what happens. Do they find happiness? Do they find the paradise? Are you optimistic for that or, or, or not? I think it's ultimately a very optimistic book. And, you know, I, I suppose when I was writing it, and I feel this vividly now, it, it was really about how America is going to end. You know, what is going to happen to this country that, that I very much consider myself a part of and very much invested in. And, and I think that there is this, 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 this idea of suspension that we have in this country right now. So it felt very present tense to me that I would not be able to answer, that I would not be able to conclude the narratives because the narratives are in a way what is going to happen to the country, what is going to happen to America. And I, I don't know. But I am optimistic about the people in America, if not the country itself. That's actually a perfect note to land on. Um, <laughs> is it? <laughs> it is, also because we're running out of time. Oh, yes. But um, to add to that, let me quote from um, something you wrote in November uh, for T Magazine. Mm. Um, you quoted um, um, a sentence attributed to the turn of the 20th century American anarchist Voltarine, de Clare, if I pronounce it correctly, and he is allegedly said, there to participate in the great historical mistake of your time, and you add, it is fitting advice, not only for artists, but for all of us, because it reminds us that history is longer than we often are capable of remembering, the time element, that years after that tweet, that post, that article, that book, that play, it rolls onward, flattening our triumphs, but also our mistakes into the dust of time. 
more life, and you mentioned him before, is the anguished cry of angels in America by Tony Kushner, but it is all of our cries too. Here now is our chance to participate. Here now is our chance to do what we think is right. Will it be a mistake? Only time knows. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to thank our honored guest, Hanya Yanagihara. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.